Hello everyone, I am here with Jordan Sheridan of Status Coup. He's been reporting on the Flint water crisis now for years. He released his documentary Flushing Flint last year. We brought him on to talk about it and he just broke a giant story for Vice and it is not getting any attention from the mainstream media but this is really just, it's incredible stuff what he found and he's here to talk about it. So Jordan, thank you so much for coming on. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. So um, I read both of the stories. You just broke two articles, basically. And the way that I read all of this was it felt like a mafia movie. Like you see genuine, like organized crime. You see payoffs. You know, um, this is really uh, it's not necessarily anything that's surprising, but the revelations nonetheless are still really shocking. I mean, to me, it was clear that Rick Snyder was a criminal. He was criminally neg negligent, you know, at a minimum. But now it's clear that this goes really deeper than that. Um, just to go over a couple of the facts here, and we'll link to the articles down below. So he tried to get the mayor of Flint, Michigan, Karen Weaver, to quote unquote have uh, uh, Elijah Cummins back off, which, you know, is interesting in and of itself. He possibly lied under oath about, uh, you know, the timeline of the Legionella outbreak. He knew about the hazard that, you know, transitioning to the Flint water supply would uh, pose to uh, the residents here. And in the background of all of these things are, you know, the way that he used his fixer and the people around him to cover this up. So can you talk through some of these really worst offenses? Because there, there's so much, the story is honestly overwhelming because there's so many moving parts here. Yeah, that's how I, I actually wanted it to be three stories, but uh, Vice wanted it to be one. So <laughs> uh, my partner, Jen and I, we go to Flint routinely. I've been going for years and we always kind of heard a lot of these rumblings, but it, it's a hard thing to put it together. Uh, so last year we were there and we uncovered that the governor's right hand, uh, the governor's right hand man had uh, allegedly made some deals uh, with the loudest residents uh, to basically quiet them down. You know, it's like a protest movement, pe corporations or governments try and identify the leaders. So uh, the governor's right hand man uh, was basically going off and uh, trying to neutralize threats to the Snyder administration, particularly threats that would threaten what really was like a PR campaign to, to sweep the water crisis under the rug. When we figured that out, we then figured out that uh, Snyder himself was under criminal investigation by prosecutors that had been fired and Snyder's chief of staff had been privately uh, subpoenaed, his treasurer had been privately subpoenaed, and his uh, right-hand man, by all accounts, was described to us kind of as his fixer or enforcer, had also been subpoenaed. So having those documents and then you know reading through the transcripts of the interviews with the special prosecutor, it took us in a bunch of different directions, and we got enough evidence that the governor was actually warned in 2013, so this is like seven years ago, uh, a year before the water switch that if Flint used the Flint River as a water source, there was bacterial risks to public health, there was carcinogens that could develop, which are cancer-causing uh, chemicals. And then we learned that uh, what he told Congress, he said he learned about it, uh, the deadly water outbreak, Legionella, which is a bacterial uh, disease from water. He said he learned about it in January 2016 and held a press conference the next day. Not so. He actually first became aware of it in October 2014, which happened to be a few weeks before his reelection uh, for governor. And his administration basically squashed it from coming out, which is really important because, I mean, it was six months after the water switch, but still early enough that if the administration would have listened to another uh, bombshell we, we found, a, a key whistleblower that was screaming, you know, Flint needs to be moved back to Detroit's water system, which it had before. If he would have listened, if they would have done so, uh, lives definitely could have been saved. If Governor Snyder isn't prosecuted, then I don't think there's going to be any hope or legitimacy for our justice system. Because, you know, part of the question uh, that I was concerned with when I had you on last time was whether or not there would be any justice in the form of him getting prosecuted. And there were investigations and whatnot, but with everything now that you've brought to light, do you honestly feel any different or encouraged about the prospect of, you know, prosecution for Snyder? Because it seems like there's no question that he committed a number of crimes. Now, this is improvable, legally speaking, yet. So it has to be, you know, he, he needs to be tried. 
Um, but what do you think is going to happen with all of this? What do you hope will happen? You know, I, I think with Flint, and a lot of times people will see Flint in a headline on YouTube or uh, just Flint. And it's not that they don't care, but they don't, they think it's just Flint. And they don't realize that the Flint water crisis is not just about a city in, in Michigan. And it's not just about water, it's about America, because it's corruption that has led to these things. And what happened in Flint is actually happening a lot of other places. It might be the water in other places. It might be education in other places. It might be pensions. It might be. But basically, the Flint water crisis was essentially a privatization scheme gone very wrong. Republicans are privatizing. Democrats are privatizing. America is one big public-private partnership, which is essentially just fancy terminology for the United Corporations of America, which is corporations buying our government. So really what I'm hoping this story accomplishes, and I'm glad, you know, it, it's not an easy read, it's long, but I think people need to realize that if there is no accountability in Flint, and again, we've proved, I think, within a, without a shadow of a doubt, to take a courtroom uh, phrase, that the Republican governor had advanced warning before he allowed that water switch to go, that bad things would happen, when they learned after the fact bad things were happening. They didn't do anything. He lied to Congress. His right-hand man, I throw in allegedly, because you know you have to as a journalist, but we found out the prosecutors were investigating. And they, the, the prosecutors were investigation, and we were told that they were investigating payoffs by the governor's right-hand man. So you'd have to be, you'd have to really think, does the governor not know what his right-hand man is doing? Is, is this guy just freelancing? So I, I hope people understand that it's not the fact that it's not surprising. You started it out with this is not surprising is the problem. Yeah. The fact that it's not surprising that our government, whether it's Republican, it's not like Democrats aren't involved with cover ups. The fact that these things would have been covered up. You know, it's one thing if a government makes a bad decision, it poisons people. But then as soon as you even suspect it, you take immediate action. Obviously, there could be fault with the initial decisions, but at least you're taking immediate action. The cover-up in this case was almost as bad as the crime because it killed people, right? So uh, the other element here is, you know, the, the after part. I mean, uh, if you think about Flint, like, let's say, uh, the Russia investigation, there was a Robert Mueller in Flint. There was a special prosecutor in Flint. Well, imagine if Ro Robert Mueller was investigating for three years and then like a new attorney general came in and fired him and dropped all the charges, if there were charges. So that's what was happening here. The previous attorney general and a special prosecutor had built up a case and our reporting indicates they were building a case against Snyder himself. And then a new Democrat attorney general came in and dropped all the charges. And it's been a year since they, almost a year since they dropped all the charges. There's been no other charges and the statute of limitations just passed for uh, not all charges, but specifically misconduct in office. Well, we obtained audio of the governor's right-hand man allegedly paying off uh, a sick Flint couple to, to silence them. They've had it since September. So I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, I, I live and breathe this story. I heard on the audio incriminating things because I know the story. So I'm assuming the attorney general's office also has incriminating things. So I think this is a bipartisan thing. The Republican uh, uh, governor and his administration did this. And now it's kind of like a Democratic attorney general. You know, my reporting indicates you might get misdemeanor charges against Rick Snyder. I don't think that's going to fly in Flint. And I also think nationally, don't mistake it. If there is no accountability, whatever that looks like, whether it's Snyder or other top officials, that just gives other public uh, government officials nationally, uh, nationally, locally, state level, hey, if they can get away with it there, you know, we won't think twice about what we're doing in your neck of the woods. Yeah, I mean, the story details basically um, alleged crime after alleged crime. Like you have literal bullet points explaining everything that happened. And this was kind of something that struck me is that if there's no accountability here with the conspiracy, the cover up, then there's literally never going to be accountability if any other governor or public official does the same thing, because this is so vast. This is so outrageous that 
if you can get away with this, then you can get away with with anything. And I know that that's a cliche, but there's just there's so much here. And the audio you referred to um, was of Adam Murphy. Now, you've had him on your show. This is an individual who protested during a town hall in January. He was experiencing cognitive impairment and whatnot, and they basically tried to pay him off. Um, so can you talk through that a little bit? Because you have the audio and explain what happened there and how they kind of tried to silence him, because I think this is just fascinating. And I think this is where you kind of get into this mafia description, yeah, which totally. it seems to me. So, you know, Flint, Rachel Maddow shows up, people show up for five minutes, you know, in 2016, and then all the cameras leave because Trump was, you know, the big thing. So once all the cameras left, that's when the real story story starts. So January 2017, there's a town hall. I wasn't at that one, but I've covered many Flint water town halls. And a really sick guy, Adam Murphy, he was having seizures. Uh, he was driving and having to call his wife because he was forgetting his route to get home. You know, water-related uh, ailments. He just went off uh, at this town hall, which, uh, you know, is understandable. Uh, screaming at state officials, you know, this this is all talk. You're not doing anything. Other uh, other residents felt the same way. So he was removed by a police officer who told him, you know, maybe I could get you in contact with a state official that could help your family. Fast forward a couple of weeks, uh, the governor's right hand man is in his living room, joined by an army colonel, uh, a state trooper and a representative from the health department. So if you're a sick person uh, and your wife is sick, and by the way, their, their newborn was born with lead in his blood because um, she was pregnant during the water crisis, you know, oh, Governor Snyder's advisor is here and maybe they really are helping. Uh, so the. We, you know, unfortunately, we didn't have it when the Vice story published. We got it after. But basically, the governor's right hand man presented it as, you know, if you call something a pilot program, you could do anything. So said, I think we could try to get state fund the state to pay for uh, your treat medical treatment. Uh, they wanted to do something called chelation, which is a holistic treatment. It injects chemicals to extract lead out of your body. A lot of people don't realize that after 30 days, lead kind of gets stuck in your bone. So even if you get a test, all of it won't show up because it's already kind of deep, deep in your system. So we're going to pay, the state's going to pay for it, um, but shh, you can't talk about it. You can't go to the media. Uh, you can't tell people the state are paying for it. And if it works for you, you know, this pilot program will we'll, we'll try to make it available for other Flint residents. So, you know, my, my indication is neither ne the, hus the husband and the wife at the time, they're not married anymore. I don't really think they like actively thought like, oh, we're doing something dirty here. They're just desperate. They're sick. The husband's falling apart. So they, they took it and they uh, he said, you know, you're going to be my lead poster child. So if it works, you know, we'll make it available to other people. Both of uh, Christine, Adam and Christina both said he said. Uh, I'm going to go back and tell the governor about this. I don't know if he did or he didn't, but he said he was going to. So it was, it did help. I mean, his le his lead levels went dramatically down. The seizures stopped. Uh, cognitive functioning got a lot better. So they're telling uh, the state health department this, the governor's right-hand man this, and expecting like, hey, I'm your, I'm your lead poster child. Can we expand the pilot and make it available to other residents? No, that didn't happen. Uh, Adam and Christina uh, split up. When that happened, they, the state completely cut off communication with Christina, who, by the way, they had told, we're going to make this available to you when you're done breastfeeding your newborn. Didn't happen. So we found out that, we, I mean, we saw emails and text messages that verified the state was paying for the treatment. But governor's right-hand man is going around telling other residents, I'm a philanthropist. I'm paying for it out of my personal pocket, which wasn't true. Uh, we also found out uh, that as part of the criminal investigation, uh, prosecutors were investigators were looking into other payoffs he might have made, including potentially giving cash to certain residents. Uh, and we also have another resident on the record that she she's basically to me like the Aaron Brockovich of Flint. She's the most outspoken resident. She's lobbied Congress. She's been a real she was a thorn in the Snyder administration side. Uh, this right-hand man to Snyder basically offered her, I'll come in, a new water heater, new interior plumbing, everything but the kitchen sink, basically, if you'll be quiet. So she is on the record saying, you know, I offered, I said, if you do that for everybody, absolutely. So it was essentially, uh, and I've told other people, the main action the Snyder administration took 
instead of just fixing the problem, it seems like they did a really grand scale PR campaign. And part of that was making sure that threats, because again, Adam getting removed from the town hall got media attention. That's why the governor's right hand man is in his living room. And I think it just gets to forget legally. Well, if you think about it legally, I'm not a lawyer, but there's two options. Either the governor knew that his top advisor was doing this, or he didn't know, and you, then you get to gross negligence that your administration is doing these things because he wasn't going, you know, if you're making private individual deals for certain Flint residents that pose a threat and you're leaving the rest of Flint to basically fend for themselves, that's obviously kind of poisoning and then leaving people to die. Yeah, it really is hard to take in all of this information. And before, when I, when I, you know, um, I either watched or read your reporting from Flint, to me, it was this question of, you know, is this incompetence or malfeasance? I mean, really, it doesn't matter. This is a distinction without a difference. But now, this story proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, like, this is malfeasance. Like, they knew what they were doing. They had the information, and they did it anyway. It was just that, you know, Rick Snyder didn't care. Um, now, Moving on to another element of the story, which is just really heartbreaking, is that there's been silence from the mainstream media, and you've been told that the reason why they're not necessarily talking about this huge story, which should be just on the minds of everyone, like people should know about this, is because of COVID-19. Um, so what has the response been like? Why do you think we haven't heard from CNN, MSNBC, any outlet who wants to, you know, expand uh, this story and talk about it because this is this could like you said Flint is a story about America this can happen in any neighborhood in any city and people aren't going to care unless they realize that this could happen to them so why do you think there's been silence here I think there's a macro reason and a micro reason I think the macro reason is frankly our media is predominantly made up of coastal cosmopolitan out of touch elitists uh, they care for about five to 10 minutes about stories that happen in communities. So Flint, Rachel Maddow does a town hall, the media is all there for a week, and then it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. I don't think it's because people are bad people. I just think we all kind of live in our bubbles. If you live in New York, DC, California, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm, I used to live in a bubble too. You know, It's not that I didn't care if I was presented with something, but we all kind of follow the day to day, um, who's up, who's down. And the progressive sphere, we do things a little differently, but you know, all of us on YouTube and other places are kind of covering the same things to an extent. So I think that if Flint, if there's like a Flint water update or this bombshell story, I don't know if the Brian Steltzers of the world really care. Uh, again, not saying you're a CNN you know, media critic. I don't think it's that he's a bad person. I just think they think the biggest thing in the world is what Trump has said or tweeted with him the last couple hours, you know? Uh, and to me, and I tweeted it earlier, it's obviously connected to coronavirus indirectly. I mean, right now, Genesee County, which Flint is part of, has a 11.4% fatality rate due to COVID-19. That is way above America's average, which last time I checked was like five point something. Flint makes up almost 50% of the county's cases. Gee, I wonder why if a city that was devastated if people, not just elderly people, but of all ages are severely immunocompromised, why they are making up such a large chunk of this county's cases. And it's not just Flint. Look at Native American reservations with uranium mining. Look at uh, areas with mass fracking going on. I mean, there's a lot of communities that are uniquely at risk. Uh, black and brown communities with where they usually dump this in, these industrial projects on. So I said to Brian, I said to others, uh, with all due respect, I, I agree, coronavirus is the top story, but I kind of think the biggest environmental cover-up of the 21st century is a close second. <laughs> and I think CNN, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Detroit Free Press, Detroit News, Flint Journal, I'm pretty sure they have enough resources to like have, an, have a nighttime editor. They all have them, that unlucky guy or gal stuck in the night shift or the weekend shift to do like a 400 word write up. Because really, it's journalistically a crime, because I would say at this point, maybe 50% of Flint has no idea what was just uncovered. Uh, so if 50% of Flint doesn't know, how do we what do we expect in terms of Michigan? What do we expect nationally? And uh, on the micro level, you know, I do think that sometimes, and it goes to progressives too. I mean, 
Uh, I mean, whatever. I don't expect the Young Turks to do much uh, re- related to me, but it, it hasn't been covered uh, wide scale in, in the progressive independent space. And I think, unfortunately, part of that is even even progressives and independent media sometimes get stuck on like, you know, oh, Biden's terrible or, oh, uh, DNC corruption, Democratic. And I get it. That's all very relevant. But we don't realize that this stuff that's happening on the local level is basically neoliberalism. Remember, this happened under this happened under Barack Obama. Let's not give him a pass. He did not. A, a federal disaster was not declared. There's a difference between a federal disaster and a federal emergency. Emergency is a state level. Federal disaster would have sent the Army Corps in to just dig up those pipes. It would have been done in a year. That was not declared for some reason. Obama went there, you know, took a sip of water, which Michael Moore and others suggest wasn't even Flint water at the time. So, uh, you know, Joe Biden, he likes to take credit for everything Obama has done. What about the failures? Should Biden answer to why this is going on still in Flint? We haven't even gotten to the point, Mike, that the water is still contaminated six years later. So to me, unfortunately, and maybe I'll write a book one day, it is really hard to gather information like this and break it. But that is not even close to as hard as getting the media to pick this up. I've had I literally had one person from The Guardian say to me, yeah, uh, we just think your sourcing is kind of uh, not great here. I said, you think document, highly confidential documents from a criminal investigation is not enough sourcing for you? The former mayor of Flint on the record that Governor Snyder tried to obstruct justice, tried to get her to get Elijah Cummings when he was alive to back off isn't like that's not enough. I said, by the way, the anonymous sourcing, like you do know for things like that, like certain uh, certain individuals that might have knowledge about a criminal investigation will not go on the record because if they do, there's there would be problems for them. So it, it was just bizarre. And honestly, I don't have an answer. It's very, very disheartening because in a in a sane media system, uh, if you break a massive story like this, it doesn't matter whether you're independent, whether corporate. If you break a story where you have the receipts, it should be on, on a front page, front pages. Uh, and, when, and when it's not, it's very difficult to get accountability. Yeah, I, I think this kind of speaks to a broader issue with the media model and just capitalist media, generally speaking. You know, if it's not sexy, if it's not sensationalized, then they're probably not going to cover it because, you know, it's not going to be monetarily beneficial for them. Um, and, you know, to me, I find this completely outrageous because, you know, you, you spent years now covering Flint. You've broken multiple stories, if not dozens. Um, and, you know, you're doing all of this and you don't even necessarily know whether or not there's going to be any payoff. Like for me, like I'll put out a good video and I'll feel like, man, I want everyone to see it. And I'll be so gutted when it doesn't get like the views and clicks. But that's like one day's worth of work. Like this is years worth of work. And it's not just that like... Um, you, you're re- revealing these issues and there's no faces like to me the biggest thing that kind of keeps me glued to this story is the fact that we've been introduced to certain residents um you've interviewed them and then you've brought them back so we're kind of seeing the progress or lack thereof that's being made and it's just it, it's it's hard to deny you know the emergency it's hard not to be fearful of your own water supply um so i, I do want to get an update before we go about the actual water crisis because you know there there's been funding there's been the initiation of the process to replace you know the contaminated pipes where are they at like when are we looking at clean drinking water for the residents of flint because it seems like at this point it's just it's never going to get done yeah and i just want to real quick about the whole sexy thing i think a lot of media outlets don't understand that there's a massive demand for this for this kind of investigative reporting. I think they just lazy yeah. and they see, oh, it's cheaper to just put two schmucks left side, right side and have a food fight. Yeah. But I mean, status quo, for example, I mean, we're not like gangbusters. We don't have like corporate fat cats, but like we've grown to like over 2000 paid members uh, doing this, this kind of stuff. Uh, we, yeah, we do live streams and things like that on day to day, but like people will support investigative reporting because there's such a void. Yeah. So I do think uh, a lot of media outlets are wrong. You know, maybe the term isn't sexy, but this is certainly desired. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing we broke two years ago, Mike, that we kind of rolled into this story. In addition to all this, Snyder's environmental department was cooking the data. 
they, they were mm-hmm. literally cheating, which I think I came on with you about. Uh, yeah, I think we me. talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. So they the, the numbers that they used for Snyder to kind of declare like his mission accomplished without the fighter pilot. They were going into the environmental officials were going into Flint residents homes and just running their water right before taking tests, which common sense, you're, you're flushing the lead out. It's against the EPA regulations, which the EPA confirmed that I broke again, crickets. A, a backstory to that is Newsweek magazine killed that story we were doing with them like a day before, which is a whole nother, whole nother thing. So uh, basically, I could only tell you what I see and the residents I speak to. The media has regurgitated this nonsense that the water is, is back and restored or whatever. If you go to Flint, you will quickly meet people that are still getting rashes from that water six years later. You will meet people that are losing hair. Uh, they're, they're quoted in this story. Uh, not to mention the long-term effects. Anecdotally, I've drank the water, you know, just sips here and there. It, it, it's like getting punched in the face. So it is, it is not normal. Um, they haven't even changed the major, all of the pipes, and they didn't even touch. So there's three pipes. The, the mains under the street, the service lines from the curb to the house, and then the interior plumbing. All they did was change the service lines. Uh, which are curved into the house. But do you think the Flint River water just skipped over the mains in the middle of the, and didn't damage the interior plumbing? Actually, our story uh, reveals uh, Mayor Weaver is also on the record that the current governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who, as you've seen, the media has been really, really like propping up as potential Biden VP. She basically told her when the mayor was trying to get additional funding to change people's interior plumbing. Sorry, can't help you. There's there's Flint fatigue, quote, Flint fatigue in the legislature. So what do you do? You got a Republican leg- a Republican governor that did it. His officials tried to cover it up. Flint, uh, Flint and Michigan votes for this Democratic governor. I could tell you the residents of Flint were very hopeful. She actually vowed coming in she's going to reopen the Flint water pods that were free water bottles stations around the city. It's been 16 months. They're not open. Uh, she told the mayor, sorry, I can't help you. There's Flint fatigue in the state legislature. Well, I don't know. You're the governor. Maybe you could fight for it. It's both morally right and like good politics. That has also been totally ignored because CNN, MSNBC, it's kind of like Trump during the campaign. Governor Whitmer is basically living in their green room virtually. She's on all the time. Now, she should be on because Michigan has been hit hard. But nobody's mentioning that like, wait a minute, this uh, relatively newer name in politics is being anointed as like a top five potential pick for Biden. She, she, she has not kept promises to Flint, which is a major environmental calamity still. So uh, bottom line, there's, it is very doubtful that the water is safe. Uh, they shut down the water pods. So, you know, Flint is 42% impoverished. A lot of people are back to drinking from the tap because they can't afford to keep going and buy, buy cartons of water. Um, so it's, it's a dicey situation. And, you know, I'll say for, to the people watching, a lot of people, I mean, shockingly, sometimes I get grief. Jordan, cover other things. You cover Flint too much. This isn't just about Flint. Flint is America. It used to be like the beacon economically of America. General Motors was born there. You want to know why Donald Trump won? He won because a lot of people in places like Flint have had their jobs sent to other countries. So I cover Flint continually and I'm not going to stop covering it because, again, if accountability is not come, it does not come here. If there's no truth, if it, it is not revealed how this poisoning happened and how the cover up happened, who is continually not doing anything, talking about the current governor, that's the playbook for other areas. And, and, and by the way, whether it's Biden, whether it's Trump, whoever the Congress people that are elected are, at the end of the day, if this continues in Flint, if there is no justice, it's coming to a neighborhood near you. Yeah, and that's why I don't understand personally why there's so little interest because like I, I fully understand that there's so many crises happening you know the genocide in Yemen um, just in our own country there's so many crises but out of self-interest people should you know worry about what's happening in Flynn because as you said there's a lot of vulnerable cities right now that are going to be dealing with this if not now in the future um, so you know if we don't fix this in Flint then this is kind of a precursor to what may happen in other countries and other ci- uh, in other cities. Um, so it, it's really frustrating. Um, 
But yeah, is there anything that you want to leave us with in terms of like this story that you just broke and what you want people to take away from this? Because it is a big story. It's a really long read, but it's worth it because you go through all of the details. You and Jen did a phen phenomenal job, um, but you start like at the very beginning. So you're going to get all of the details. It's a long read, but it's worth it. Um, anything that you want people to take away from the story that you just uh, broke? Uh, we're not done. I have a follow-up. I don't know when this is publishing, but we have a follow-up coming out tomorrow because uh, we found some pretty interesting information about the current attorney general who dropped all the charges. Uh, might be some conflicts of interest uh, in her office related to the water crisis. So that, that will drop tomorrow. Um, you know what I'll say, Mike? I think that book behind you really says a lot, Manufacturing Consent, because you asked why is it that there's not broader appeal? Because manufacturing consent works multiple ways. One of the ways is to manufacture consent for things. It also works in manufacturing consent for what's important. So the media, through what it chooses to cover relentlessly, Trump, the horse race, who's up, who's down, uh, it, it's, it's a form of programming, particularly in older Americans, no offense, but that's the general cable news audience, the New York Times readership. Obviously, uh, younger, even like under 50 and under 40, we're starting to realize aren't really that demographic. But if you never see stories like Flint, uh, like East Chicago, Indiana, that has a major lead problem. We haven't even gotten into Kifas, which is a, a cancer-causing chemical from the manufacturing of Teflon being found all over water bodies around the country. Guarantee a majority of people watching right now have no idea that the hedge fund uh, sleaze bags in New York, one of their big investments the last few years, water, because they think water might be the future oil and there might be a shortage of clean water. So all of this is massively important. But why would CNN owned by AT&T? Why would NBC owned by Comcast? Why would Amazon owned by Jeff Bezos? I mean, why would any of these places find it important? Right. They don't find these things sexy. So what viewers find sexy or not sexy is largely informed by what the media declares is, quote unquote, sexy. So that's why that's why we started status quo. I don't want to like be like to bring sexy back, but we started <laughs> this. We started this because I think people honestly. How we have uncovered this is I've been there 15 times. Jen has been there seven times, but we've largely like just given the microphone back to the people. And you really learn where all the bodies are buried. When you go into these places as journalists, I don't talk to pundits. I don't talk to experts first. I talk to residents because that's who knows who's corrupt. That's who knows. So uh, the, the thing I'll leave the audience with is, number one, we do have a YouTube channel, Status Coup. You might not know that because YouTube is throttling the hell out of us. So Status C-O-U-P, subscribe if you can. If you want to support this reporting, uh, it's statuscoup.com slash join. Low is uh, five bucks a month. And most importantly, you know, spread the word. I mean, I on my Twitter, uh, the story is right at the top. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get action unless public officials are shamed. Uh, that's what I've realized. And the media. Shame the media. Detroit Free Press only covered this because the attorney general's office came out basically threatening, you know, our source. Uh, they want to find who the source is. Sound familiar to Trump? Uh, they want to find sources, kind of subtly, you know, I think threaten us to not continue reporting, which isn't going to work. So this is super important. It's not just Flint. Uh, it is connected to coronavirus, as we've spoken about. And hey, I think Bernie said it best. Uh, are you willing to sacrifice for someone you don't know? Yeah. Exactly. And really what's important for people to know is that it's not just the simple, you know, Flint still doesn't have clean drinking water, which we see people tweet occasionally just to kind of remind individuals of this crisis. It's it's a lot deeper than that. It's a lot more complicated. And the deeper you go, the more troubling the details seem to be. So, you know, just if you have time, I'll link to all of these um, the the uh, articles as well as the videos down below. So definitely check them out. Um, I want to shift gears because um, recently you stated on Twitter that you tested positive for COVID-19. And I think that it would be informative for people to kind of know what you experienced, uh, how you were able to get a test, maybe how you think you came into contact with the virus. Can you just talk through that? Honestly, to this day, I don't even know how I got a test. I, I randomly, uh, my girlfriend's friend mentioned this doctor's office. Uh, one it, it, oh, one medical, excuse me. They're not paying me, uh, <laughs> which I guess does, has an app and does like virtual appointments too. So I was doing virtual points, appointments with them. And then my cough got so severe with the fever, I decided to go to the office. 
and they had a test. So I guess I, I, I don't, maybe I lucked out. So uh, that's how I knew I had it. They actually did say that there's a lot of false negatives too. So a lot of people are being told they're negative and the tests are not foolproof. Um, honestly, I think for me, it was uh, amp maybe made worse because when you have something like this, the, the suggestion is rest. And I was like in the home stretch of finishing this Vice story. So like I was working 14 hours a day. Uh, it's, it's stressful. That's not good if you have a virus. So I think, I mean, my cough, luckily I haven't been coughing during this interview, but it, it kind of like, I think it's gone and then it comes back. It, it, this has been going on for like a month. Uh, but the best way to describe it is just, uh, in my case, severe cough that was hurting my back, uh, was hurting my ribs a little bit because you're coughing nonstop. At one point I was coughing nonstop for at least nine days. Um, and the fever fortunately went away after three or four days, never went higher than 101. I didn't have any breathing problems. Uh, but I think people should realize like the my even the mild version, some of these like idiots on, on Twitter are like, oh, it's just a cold. I've never had a cold this bad. I mean, it was not just a cold. And frankly, I'm lucky because the people in my situation that weren't didn't have the breathing problems, didn't have the hospitalizations, like who knows what makes it go that direction, you know, versus another. Because there's people healthier than me that have died. So there's people like super athletic. I don't really exercise that much uh, who died. So it, it really, it, it's it, the jury's out on how certain people respond. Uh, for me, I'm just guessing, but I think I got it from a supermarket because uh, I was wearing a mask. We were wearing gloves, but, in, you know, New York City is very dense. You could try to stay six feet from people, but New York City, people are just, you know, I've always said there needs to be walking lanes because everybody's just in their own world, walking in the middle of the curb and not mm -hmm. really, you know, bumping into you. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure I probably got it that way, which tells you, you can get this even wearing a mask, gloves. Um, you know, I think the experts even like first it was six feet, then they said, well, it might need to be more. Then they said, oh, well, it, it, you could get it just if you walk past someone that breathed. <laughs> like, so I don't really know how I got it, but I got it. I'm lucky. Uh, you know, privileged in a way I work from home when I'm not traveling. I you know, there's Amazon workers that I've spoken to that think they have it, but are going in anyway because they can't afford not to get paid. That's another scandal that yeah. they don't have paid sick leave unless you test positive. Um, yeah, but it's it's not been pleasant. Uh, it's been going on. I thought I was better, uh, but I'm starting to cough again. I'm, 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 I would hope I'm out of the woods for anything more serious. Uh, and it's also, I mean, just to be honest with you, it's, it's affected the business a little bit because I haven't really been going live or doing videos that often. Uh, I actually, to tell you the truth, got worse because the day I broke the Vice story, I, I went live because it's like, I'm not, you know, I want my audience to know about this and so we want to play this up, but I was still like deeply sick. So I just going live for an hour took a hell of a lot out, out of me. I mean, my girlfriend even said like, it's like you just ran like a marathon. So uh, this thing is exhausting and I really am very, very uh, dismayed to see all these morons governors and you know oh we're gonna reopen the economy slow by slow like as we pass the death toll of the vietnam war um i know people are going crazy cabin fever but i don't understand uh maybe you have an answer you can't contact trace in new york city you can't contact trace in these major cities how the hell do you know who passed me on the way to the supermarket or who who was in the supermarket with me it's just asinine so uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think the answer is reopening these gyms and hair salons and all that uh, because you might be willing to take the risk, but that's not fair to other people who are not willing to get infected by you. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that if we just all hunker down for a couple of months and wait until this blows over, that's the best case scenario because I, I think that, you know, staying inside, getting cabin fever, that's a better outcome than getting the virus. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you started to experience symptoms, was this like something that was gradual? Like, did you feel a tickle in your throat um, and then did it kind of build or did you just wake up one day with like a huge, like horrible cough? Because I have a friend who just tested positive. She's in healthcare, so this isn't super surprising, but it's just, 
you know, the way she describes it is it, this is horrible. There's no energy. Um, you know, you don't you don't want to get out of bed. You just sleep. Um, so how did this happen for you? Was it sudden or was it gradual? I started coughing a little bit on a set on Saturday, uh, like weeks ago. Sunday, the cough became severe. And then Monday, I had a fever. So it was pretty quick. I mean, mild cough next day, severe cough, then fever. I didn't have it as bad as your friend. Fortunately, I could get out of bed. I wasn't like super, super exhausted. Um, but I think the worst part, your your body, you get fatigued from coughing nonstop for seven days. So I was just exhausted from the coughing. Uh, and mentally, I'll be honest with you, again, like just people dying, so I'm not complaining. But mentally, it does take a toll on you because at least when I didn't know I had this, you know, it's it's said like you can go outside to take a walk if you're keeping distance, you know. So at least you get that like 20 minute, half hour break from being stationary. You know, I live in a one bedroom apartment. So when you're qu literally quarantined for I was in here for two straight weeks, it, you get a little kooky. I mean, yeah. I, I was getting a little kooky uh, because it's just tough to be confined in that area again like people are dying or hospitalized so I don't have it you know I'm not complaining but that was uh one component and uh the other thing I'll just say is I think that um it's really a shame that in this situation uh the media is ignore it's it's kind of like with school shootings they're doing the play-by-play -play instead of talking about the root I don't see the media talking about like there is zero discussion in the media corporate media why are, why are we even paying rent right now? Right. Why are we paying rent? Why, why are we paying mortgages? I mean, you look at Europe, the, the government's either paying for like 80 to 90% of people's pay, uh, companies' payrolls, or in some cases, just like, you know, mortgage paused, uh, rent paused, not like paused and then you pay it all back in one lump sum, just like erased for now. And your landlords, mortgages so they don't they don't suffer like the fact that corporations run our government and i've said to my audience like it doesn't matter if biden or trump wins because i mean i think trump's a little worse but the bottom line is neither of them make the decisions it's, it's their donors that are making decisions but there's no like deep discussion about why is it that in the united states of america when something like this happens why are 20 million people now out of work and no health care like it's mentioned but there's no that is a disaster and it could be fixed like right now. And it's a scandal that the Democratic frontrunner is not saying, yes, right now, Medicare for all. We'll talk about it. You know, I disagree with it permanently, but right now, Medicare should just pay for all of this. Uh, it, it's completely scandalous. And the future is bleak. I'm going to talk to Richard Wolf uh, later this week, but it's going to be like 2008, Mike. I mean, these companies mm -hmm. are not hiring back all these workers when times are good. They'll do more with less. So you're going to have you know, talk about Andrew Yang, the jobless economy is going to be expedited quicker. A lot of these people are not going to get employed back, uh, not to mention opioid epidemic getting worse because of dep unemployment, depression, uh, suicides, those kind of things. And there's very little talk of it. And, you know, I love Bernie, but he has not organized his army to they can't protest in, in physical space now, but he has not organized his army to demand these things. Uh, now is the time. Uh, I don't agree with some that are going off the rails and Bernie's a sellout and a coward. I don't agree with that. But now is the time to just say straight up, like, no, we're not paying our rent. This is absurd. We we don't have jobs. Like, it's crazy. Um, so I think there's a broader discussion than just the health pandemic. And uh, I, I hope also, I mean, look, there, there's a reason that African-Americans are, are being hit disproportionately, uh, downtrodden communities. So I hope that uh, these parts of the discussion enter uh, into it. But yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm going to be fine. And uh, hopefully nobody else gets this. It's not pleasant. Yeah, well, we're glad to hear that you're doing okay. I think that like hearing you say that you tested positive for a lot of people like this makes it really real. If you don't know someone who's had this, um, I've known a couple of people now who has had this, but if you don't, then like hearing from someone who comes out and says it, I think it really makes it real. And I think it it's important because it encourages people to actually be more responsible because you hear about these stories in the news. We're overwhelmed every single day, but it doesn't seem like a real thing unless you actually put a face to it. And like having you come out and say it, I think there's a real utility in that. And, you know, just letting people know that this is serious and you need to take it serious. You know, thankfully you're okay. It could have been worse for you, but it's still, it's no walk in the park, you know? So, 
So um, yeah. thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, uh, before we leave one last time, can you plug your website? Yeah, youtube.com slash status coup. That's C-O-U-P, uh, status coup.com. And uh, yeah, definitely subscribe. Uh, if you got a couple bucks, uh, it's five bucks a month, status coup.com slash join. And um, super, super important right now, support independent media, whether it's us, Mike, if you can do all, all, uh, as many as you can. Obviously, people are hurting uh, themselves. But I think we've seen from this campaign, uh, manufacturing consent is on steroids these days. And I think part of a, a large portion why Bernie lost, I mean, just think about it. There was Biden got $100 million in free advertising between South Carolina and Super Tuesday. That's, that's not insane. my opinion. That was reported. That's so, insane. And, I'll, and the exit poll showed, uh, I think, 50 percent of people that voted for Biden decided in those final days. So it, it wasn't indefinite that he was going to clean up on Super Tuesday. Remember, Bernie was like the declared. He was basically the front runner on 60 Minutes, like. Right before then. So I think uh, we need to support independent media to counter this day after day propaganda. So definitely uh, check us out if you can on YouTube status coup. All right. Thank you so much, Jordan Sheridan. Once again, um, really appreciate it. Whenever you break news stories, we'd love to have you because I think this is important and people need to know. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you having me on and caring about Flint.